Well, good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, depending upon where you are in the world, and welcome to today's DevOps.com webinar. I'm Charlene O'Hanlon, moderator for today's event, and I welcome you. As always, we have a great event on tap, but before we get started, we do have a few housekeeping items we need to go over. First of all, today's event is being recorded, so if you miss any or all of the event, you will have the opportunity to access it later on. Following today's webinar, we will be sending out an email that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And we are taking questions from the audience. So if at any time during today's presentation, you have a question for either of our speakers, please don't wait, don't hesitate. Just use your GoToWebinar control panel and submit your question. And we will try to get to as many as we can before the end of today's webinar. Also during today's webinar, we do have four polling questions. So, uh, Hopefully we can get you guys involved in those. And at the end of today's webinar, we are doing a drawing for four $25 Amazon gift cards. So please stick around. Hopefully you'll be one of our four lucky winners. All right, with that, let's go ahead and kick off today's webinar, which is how SLOs enable fast, reliable, reliable application del delivery. Easy for me to say, oh my gosh. Our speakers today are Marco Coulter, who's technical evangelist at AppDynamics, and Dylan Owens, who is the staff software engineer at Blameless. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks a lot. Um, Good day and welcome to, I'll see if I can say it, how SLOs enable fast, reliable application delivery. This is intended, as I said, an, to be an interactive session, so we're going to hit you with some poll questions on the way through and add your questions in the Q&A window. The good news is that today I'm joined by Dylan Owens from Blameless, so you won't just be hearing my accent. Maybe what we should do is introduce ourselves. So Dylan, do you want to go first? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Marco. Um, I'm Dylan Owens. I'm a staff software engineer at Blameless. I specifically head up the SLO team. And uh, today I'll be talking about SLOs as well as walking you through a demo on how SLOs work in the Blameless platform. And on the next slide, I am Marco Coulter. I'm an immigrant who has lived in three countries and managed teams in 13. Uh, I enjoy technology a little too much. Uh, mainly I like helping others use technology, which is where this evangelist role came from, and sometimes growing vegetables on my city terrace. Today we're going to cover the connection between application delivery and service level objectives, or SLOs, a key concept of site reliability engineering, or SRE. So you're going to hear me say SLO and SRE quite a bit in this. I'll begin with why application delivery is harder than it's ever been due to the complexity of the modern application. Then Dylan's going to describe how his experiences as an SRE show SLOs are the solution. Now SLOs might sound simple, but managing and measuring them is detailed. And we'll talk about the importance of extensibility and how combining two industry leading vendors is the right approach. But seeing is believing, so we put some time in here for Dylan to demonstrate what all of this looks like in the real world. And at the end, we'll take your questions, so make sure to stick them in there on the way through. Before we get going, we actually want to understand you folks a little. Can we please push out the first poll? Now, to reduce bandwidth usage, Dylan and I are going to turn off our cameras during the presentation. We'll come back at the end during the Q&A. So we're seeing some good responses coming in. Just gonna give it a second for a few more people to get their votes in. So little surprise that in an early presentation like this, we're seeing um, a number of people with a majority by the looks of it being researching only. So can we pull the push the results of the poll out for a moment? Okay, so here are the answers to date. 48% um, of researching only, so that's good. We're gonna talk a little bit about how you get started with SRE and SLOs as well. I noticed that no one went for SRE ninjas, and that's not necessarily too surprising, but it's great that 16% are already deploying these sorts of technologies in their environment. Let's get back to the presentation. So one of the things that I think we're all aware of in the, in the entire world right now is that our world has changed. So 
So what you're seeing here, and let's look at some of the data that supports that. What you're seeing here, three key or two key statistics. This is coming from research that we ran um, in 2020. So they are reflecting the impact of COVID-19 already. So almost everybody, 80%, was struggling with spikes and changes in traffic. Folks often don't have the visibility they need to crash through diagnosis to resolution. So these spikes end up impacting the customer experience. Roughly the same number, 79%, see COVID-19 accelerating digital transformations and they expect even that companies that are not agile enough are going to fail. And I don't mean in just a simple agile process manager man, um, manner here, I mean like the quote here of perpetual agility. So even before COVID-19 struck as an industry, we were getting better at preventing outages. We invested in DevOps and resiliency and SRE, and that paid off in, a, in fewer outages. But the only problem is that users actually have a different priority. Now the numbers I'm about to quote aren't here on the screen, so you may wanna make a note of them. But we asked users what types of problem frustrate you when using a digital service? And the top answer selected by 55% of respondents was performance, response loading and time is slow. Availability, not available when I need it, came second with only 40% of respondents. So 55 for performance, 40% for availability. Now when I first saw this, I was confused. How can slow performance be more frustrating than not having performance at all? And then I thought about how much of the user's time is consumed by each. You see, when an app is down, you know straight away and you move on to other tasks, you only lose a few seconds of your life. But when an app is slow, it saps away your life. Say you're depositing a check, you wait for the app to open and then some more time to log in and then more time to select that deposit transaction you want. And then you're waiting for the camera to open so that you can scan your check and then more time entering the value and confirming and on and on. A slow app, wastes your life away at every stage. And that is why SLOs are focusing on latency as well as availability. We know that today's environment are no longer simple monolithic architectures. Today, we must support hybrid architectures spanning multiple operating models, leading to this explosion of complexity and interdependencies and all of these pieces of the puzzle, they are all producing data about themselves as well. And this puts us at risk of having these islands of disassociated data. Unfortunately, some of the tools we use to help even, well, they even add to this tsunami of data and may even create new isolated islands of data. But the customer experience lives across all of these islands and, and hides within that tsunami, that pile of data. So the folks who respond to anomalies, well, they're often still in teams that are scattered either physically or logically around the globe. So you need coordination across these dispersed teams to respond. Some of our enterprises, well, they kind of look like, they remind me of movie androids where the android gets its arms and legs torn off and each limb still moves on its own, but with no common goal. Humans achieve this with a central nervous system to collect data and correlate data with context. And then we're deriving the insight so that we can take action. So at AppDynamics, we want to be the central nervous system for the digital enterprise. Let me describe what that might look like. So CNS, central nervous system is powerful. You start with giving visibility to all of these domains on the left here, applications, business, security, observability, and et cetera, et cetera. And you bring all of that together into a centralized core, the circle in the middle, that uses artificial intelligence machine learning in a cognition engine to dynamically baseline metrics because setting thresholds is a pain, and to correlate the metrics to understand how they're working and interrelating to each other. So we do away with the challenges of isolated data islands. You can't correlate them if the data is still in silos. You have to bring it together into a central place. And then the artificial intelligence can see the patterns for anomaly detection and automated root cause analysis. And that's the insight. That's giving you the context around the anomaly. 
And then of course, you need to take action to address the anomaly. And that's where integrations, uh, this is where sort of self-configuring and self-optimizing can go on to help augment your response to these things. And then the final piece on the bottom of the screen here is the feedback loop. Making sure that the action taken had the desired results. So when the anomaly is resolved, the state should return to normal. So at AppDE, at AppDynamics, we know that we could not do all of this ourselves. Partnerships like the one between AppDynamics and Blameless are critical for your success in your enterprise environments. Integration and extensibility are key to solving these heightened delivery complexity and customer expectations. So let's talk about customer expectations for a moment. See, customer expectations can sort of be stated simply. They increase, they rise every year. The apps that your customers use should be available and perform at high levels every successive cycle. Traditionally, development would slow feature releases to ensure that quality. But customers won't let you do that, right? They also expect that you add a lot of new things a lot faster. They want both and existing processes aren't necessarily built to support that. So remember when it comes to the customer experience, you're not just competing in whatever your industry vertical may be, you're competing against the expectations set by major companies like Apple and Netflix. But we only need extensible, or sorry, we not only need extensible platforms like this central nervous system, we also need a new approach to dev velocity and reliability. And that's where site reliability or engineering comes in. So there's a lot of detail on this slide. No need to screenshot it. You can get a copy of the whole PowerPoint later. If I had to pick three things from this as highlights, it would be these. SRE is not just about giving your engineers a new job title. It requires a culture change to remove blame. And of course, that's where the name of our partners, partners today, Blameless, comes from. And the next one is monitoring. Monitoring is the base of the SRE needs hierarchy. If you sort of Google SRE needs hierarchy, you'll see a pyramid diagram. At the bottom of that diagram, the base of everything is monitoring. If you can't measure your environments, you will fail. SLIs and SLOs are the things that will set you free. They give you a data-driven basis for decisions that can free you from release anxiety. And that brings me to the changing nature of SLOs and how slowdowns are different to outages. Now we know that SLOs are focusing on latency to match the customer's concerns on experience, the 55% and 40% I mentioned earlier. We have a lot of processes as an industry around responding to outages. Outages are easy. A farmer plows through a power cable and your systems are down. Outages are obvious. Slowdowns are different. Slowdowns are subtle. The DBA adds a new function, making the SQL call just a little slower. The icon turns from green to yellow on the database, but not red. The infrastructure team thinks maybe you're a little over provisioned and takes a pod from your Kubernetes cluster making it just a little slower and the infrastructure icon might turn yellow, um, but not red. And then that data center guy, and it always seems to be a guy who practices hacky sack near the back of the network rack, well, he loosens a cable and adds some errors into your regular network traffic, just a little slower. The network icon might turn yellow. But when each of these things turn yellow, the customer experience gets the accumulated slowdown of all of those milliseconds. They're deleting, and by the end of it, they're in red and they're going to delete your app for a faster app. So I have a whole session on how slow down is the new outage. I won't go and do it now, but I, I might post some links in the chat room later or we'll point you to a blog post I've written about it. Now, before I hand over to Dylan, though, I want to talk about, or sorry, I have another poll for you. So get ready to answer a poll. Can we push out the second poll, please? So the question here is, how would you react if someone said your primary application experienced a say 87, 88 hour outage? Would you, would you raise a jury ticket? Would you start a war room? Would you panic? Would you be selling off your company stock or options at that point? So I'm gonna let that sit there for a second as the responses come in. We're up to about 20%. We've 
we'd like a few more of you to answer the question for us. While we are waiting, I do want to remind the audience that you can, uh, if you have a question for either of our speakers, you can always use your GoToWebinar control panel and submit your question at any time during the presentation. You don't have to wait for the question and answer period. So Dylan, what do you think about some of these responses here? Let's take the poll back out of the field, thanks. Absolutely. So it looks like a lot of people are saying or suggesting to start a war room, which is pretty great. That means a lot of us at least have the experience to go in and gather the right resources and create an area where we can expedite resolving the issue. I do like to see that some people would suggest to sell off the company's stock options. That's, a, that's one solution to the problem. But it does seem like everyone has a general consensus to start a war room or raise a Jira ticket. All right, so I'm going to move on to the next slide. So the solution, service level objectives. Here we're going to go over what service level objectives are. Even if some of you do know what they are, I still want to go over them in detail so we fully understand the breadth of what we're trying to capture and cover here. Service level objectives, really at the root of it, is a forecast or a meteorology report into how your service is actually doing. Really what we're trying to capture here is understanding over time what your monitoring is actually doing in conjunction with what you say your customers should expect from your company. SLIs, that's the service level indicator. That's the actual monitoring unit that goes out and starts to pull in information and then it passes it on to the SLO. And the SLO's job is responsible for taking that information provided from the SLI and comparing it against with what you set in the SLO. Whether you're comparing a latency, let's say you have an SLI and we want a latency of 250 milliseconds and we have a target of 95%. Well, the SLO is going to go in, take all these events, and they're going to measure it against each other and make sure that it's actually capturing what you expect the customer to experience and then reporting any indication if it's below what is actually meant to be set. The SLA, put, plainly put, is something that is reacted to by the SLO. So SLOs for us are kind of a governance to the SLA. It gives us the ability to actually tell if we're you know, violating the SLA or not. Because previously, SLAs were just used as a general uptime, downtime. But as system changes happen, and as Marco put, availability and latency are kind of the new trend, and that's what we're trying to monitor here. So when we want to actually say, how, are we meeting our SLA? we would go back to our SLO and try to use that as a governance to see where we're at. Where this really comes into play for the person trying to monitor the SLO is error budgets. Error budgets come in by suggesting the amount of allowable unplanned system failure that you actually have for your SLO. Over the course of an SLO, you may see your error budget reduce, you may see it be completely exhausted, and you may see it continue to rise. What we try to do is we try to capture everything in a rolling window and use those values to capture what your error budget is currently doing. Rolling windows generally set can be 30 days, sometimes they're 90 days. But in Blameless, we like to capture everything at a 28 day interval, as it seems pretty consistent with what engineers across multiple organizations deal with day to day. SLOs are another way to align competing priorities. As we all know, there are a lot of tiers in an organization, and there are a lot of competing factors that people are trying to measure. As an executive, what you generally want to try to adhere to is your SLA. You're not so focused on maybe what a product or an engineer person would be focused on, which is feature velocity, CSAT and churn, but you're really trying to ensure that the business is running at the complete capacity that it's expected and agreed upon in your SLA. Operations, well, they're not really concerned on the right or the left. They're purely put, they're focused on minimizing the business risk from the infrastructure side. They want to measure things like availability, latency, throughput, durability, correctness, saturation. And their whole goal really is to help both sides. They're trying to help the dev teams increase their speed and they're trying to help business insiders be able to lead with factual knowledge. Product engineers, well, they're not really trying to make sure that they're helping the operations, even though we try as best as we can, but really they're trying to ensure that we can push out the features that the business leads are trying to request from us. And what we're trying to do there is building new functionality, and then we're trying to figure out a way to monitor these things. And for an engineer, where that comes in is an SLO. We can set up SLOs on feature releases or new pieces of the infrastructure that we're adding or new APIs, 
And that gives us the confidence to know that we're monitoring things in a correct way and something that we can proactively look to as a forecast to ensure that what we've released actually meets the expectations here. These are common pitfalls of SLOs. And I'm gonna go over a few more than are what here, but I often get asked, what is the value of SLOs beyond the measure, measurement of reliability? That's a great question that I always hear. SLOs aren't just a measurement of reliability, but they're also a way to give people power. They're able to provide you knowledgeable insight and a forecast onto what's actually happening in your system. We can go run things in Grafana, we can go do you know, other graphs or look at other reports and other systems, but it's hard to pull those into a centralized area and actually see the value in real time. And that's the, the beauty of SLOs is we get to see and we get a forecast and we kind of have a generalized understanding. But more than that, in blameless, SLOs are a triggering point. If your SLO starts to falter, it starts to drop below your threshold, it's easy to create a, an, an alert and create a blameless incident or create a ticket or reach out to ServiceNow and create a ServiceNow incident or a number of other myriad of solutions that we have. How do I know if my SLOs truly measure customer experience? This one's tricky. Generally, we wanna measure things that are close to the customer layer because customers are their immediate feedback point. If a customer experiences a slowdown, as Marco put, it costs us money. So we wanna make sure that when our SLOs are set up and defined, that we're capturing them as close to the user journey by going through a process. And Blameless has a good document on how we walk each company through and setting up their user journeys. And the real way that you understand is if your SLO is measuring customer experience is by the endpoints and by how your SLO is fluctuating over time. If you have a high use service, it's pretty guaranteed that you're trying to measure some level of customer experience. But if you have a low RPS service, it may not be so that the customer is interacting with that service too often. How do I get organizational buy-in to drive adoption of SLOs for the long term? That's becoming, becoming a bit easier as we see more companies are going for a top-down approach of SLOs and more executives are trying to push SLOs as a kind of guiding pole for all organizations and all tiers. Generally, the goal that we've seen in the most successful way is that we want companies to adopt from the bottom up with top-down support. So the best concept is to immediately show value in small pods. So we wanna adopt SLOs on small teams and then show the value by measuring SLOs over a period of time. And generally we say two months is a good period of time to measure your SLO and show impactful improvement. At what point do I stop working on features and start working on reliability? This is the beauty of SLO. You know really early on, pretty quickly. With Blameless, we have an error budget. We tell you how much you've exhausted in your SLO. We have a negative burn down graph that shows you where your error budget starts and where it ends at whatever your day you're viewing it on. When you should start working on reliability is when your team agrees at the point in the threshold that you set. There's no defined cadence. Generally, the Google handbook would say, you start working on reliability as soon as you might encounter a reduction in your error budget. But that's not always what every team might do. Embarking on SLOs. SLOs are really hard to, one, adopt, one to get buy-in, and one to really get the data in the right area. A lot of companies now are using AppDynamics, a lot of companies are using other APM platforms. It's really, really cognizant of each team to pull all those data points together into user journeys. And user journeys are a collection of SLOs. And why Blameless wants to bucket SLOs into a user journey is because that's the area that we expect customers, or we expect the flow of your product and the experience of your customer to happen in. So we wanna capture each SLO associated to your user journey because then it makes it another easier bucket, another easy bucket to understand how your application is performing. Let's say you had a payment page. You might have four SLOs in there, one to execute the payment, one to execute tax, one to return a success, or one to return a failure. Well, we wanna group all those together because what we plan to do at Blameless is to aggregate all those together and use some form of ML to actually give you a forecast on how those user journeys are doing, but more importantly, to give you immediate insight into how specific portions of your application are doing at an aggregated level. Lack of buy-in, like we discussed in the previous one, we try and go for that top-down support for the bottom-up uh, approach, where we have bottom-down individuals working to implement the SLOs with the, the support of maybe an SRE or someone else, and then we get them to actually start using that and operationalizing it week over week. SLOs are not one and done. SLOs are a continuously evolving thing. That means you should be monitoring your SLOs on a weekly cadence 
and you should be discussing about them. Sometimes your SLO may not be right. You may have not configured it to monitor or set the threshold exactly with what your service is capable of doing. That's why it's important to go in, review, and then make adjustments and changes as you see the SLO over time. That's to say that SLOs are never going to be finished or they're never going to be not tweaked. There will always be tweaks and there will always be changes. The end mark to this is that you have data-driven focus, that people can truly focus on what is important to them and not be focused on going and monitoring something in um, you know, a telemetry system or going in Grafana or going in App Dynamics or going somewhere that would potentially take their focus away unless they absolutely need it, right? We want to use and leverage those systems when they're critical. We don't want you to go there to try and define or ascertain certain values that can be easily garnered from another tool. So the component of SLO, this is the life cycle. We document the user journey and really, like I said, Blanus is a good way to do that. We have a, a system that you can go through and you can understand and identify key areas of your product that you want to set up. You calculate your SLIs and you connect your SLOs. This is the portion where you set up your monitoring, you define what your thresholds are with the support of other uh, people within your organization, and then you go into monitoring the SLO. And that, again, of course, is obviously against your customer experience. And this is where you also define error budgets. Error budgets, we have something called error budget policy, where you define thresholds and you define actions that are going to be taken when your SLOs move through different stages. That's step four, we're alerting on SLOs to improve the focus and minimize noise. Blameless is all about taking and building the war room and the experience for you and abstracting the need to pull all of the right resources into the room and also set everything up because that takes time. We want you to get to the root of the problem and solve it faster. And that's step five, we're minimizing toil through adopting SRE best practices. This SLO is a big thing. We're all adopting it. It's relatively new in our industry and there's a lot of questions about it. So I'd like to push out another poll, poll question three. How would you react if someone said your primary application experienced 100 milliseconds slowdown? Would you raise a Jira ticket? Would you start a war room? Would you panic? Or would you sell off company stock options? So Dylan, of course, the difference between the two questions is here, it's, it's just a 100 millisecond slowdown. But let's see some people are starting to vote and come in. So I just want to get some more answers in and then we'll look at the results and explain those two questions as well. Just a few more seconds. So if you want to get your answer in, please click now. Okay, let's push out the results. Now what you're seeing here is a significant difference between when it's an 87 hour outage to 100 millisecond slowdown. Here you see most people, you've got 84%, they'd say, oh yeah, I'd race a Jira ticket. Um, I think, oh, somebody who did like just um, selling off company options um, and a couple of selecting store rooms. So clearly how we're responding to this is not the same as how we're responding to the outage. So that's one of the reasons why we ask these two questions this way. Our research into the digital reflex shows that slowdowns do not get the same attention from IT folks. And that's a mistake. So let's go back to our presentation. We should prepare for addressing slowdowns as we do for outages, and here's why. Before I get to this quote on the screen, a quick story. On June 28th of 2019, Slack users noticed a significant performance issue affecting Slack's most popular services, the login, the messaging, posting files, etc. During the slowdown, Slack was registering about a 10 to 25% error rate. Now that might be, well, however you react to that, you've got to consider Slack's 10 million daily user base. So that's at least a million users having a bad experience. And that slowdown led Reuters to put Slack on the top five IT outages for 2019. Slowdowns hurt your reputation, slowdowns matter. So let's come to this quote, on the screen about from, from Amazon. 100 millisecond delay costs about 1% of sales. If you're always on business and imagine for this discussion that your revenue comes in evenly all year. Right? So 1% loss of revenue is the equivalent to having an 87 hour outage. 
Yet, as you saw in the two poles, we react to 100 milliseconds very different to an equivalent outage. Now, your mileage may vary. Maybe 100 milliseconds doesn't equal 1%. Maybe it equals 5%. Maybe it equals 0.001%. But the real question here is, do you even know how your revenue varies with performance? Now, there are tools already available to measure this, and there are processes to manage the results to prevent customer loss and revenue loss we need to operationalize the service level objectives that Dylan was describing. Okay, so now you understand the criticality of SLOs. Let's talk about putting them in place and the integration needed. I talked earlier about our central nervous system strategy, right? And four components, visibility, insight, action, and feedback. You can turn to App Dynamics for visibility and insight. These are our strengths. You can turn to Blameless for action and feedback and partners in both cases. And let's look at how this works in reality. Imagine that you're a global insurance provider. You're selling car and home insurance through the web. First, you're going to need real time service metrics. Now, App Dynamics, we've led the application performance management industry for a decade now. We're very good at bringing in real-time telemetry, logs and service metrics, and then correlating them all to the user experience and the business impacts. We will pick up as early as in an, indi I'm sorry, we will pick up as early an indicator as possible of potential customer facing impact. So these user journeys, like they have a major financial impact. You've got that sort of small latency that we were talking about, that availability, that impacts drastically upon the top line. So AppDynamics brings the data and context for those key user journeys, such as logging into the portal and starting a claim or buying the insurance. And then you will select your SLIs and negotiate your SLOs. And now you're going to use Blameless to operationalize those SLOs, to put them in place. And now you're getting, it might even just be something so simple as when you're getting close to missing an SLO, you trigger an action to sync to service now and create a ticket. So that you're aware that thing, you know, that doom is coming well before it actually comes. So you now have this data-driven way to drive conversations and actions rather than that sort of point in time firefight reaction to things. You can go, we need to start acting on this now, not on Saturday night when you get paged. Now you are surfacing, the other thing here is that you're surfacing technical debt when it comes to impacting the customer. Um, the beauty of all that, look, these are some college things. Seeing is believing. So let's go to the Dylan and to the demonstration. While Dylan's setting up the demonstration, we have another poll to push out to you. I, I warned you we want, we're going to be interactive here. So please push out the fourth poll. And the question here is, do you apply SLOs in your organization today? We asked about SRE as a general concept before. This is specifically if you're applying SLOs. Yes, no, or not sure. All good answers. So if people could respond to those now. Okay, again, while we're waiting, just want to remind the audience that if you have a question for either of our speakers, any time is a good time to go ahead and get those questions and just use your GoToWebinar control panel and submit them. And we've got a good response now. I'll just wait a few more seconds. Okay. Can we push the res the re responses out? Dylan, what do you think of those? Do you apply, sorry, I was muted. Uh, it's interesting, as I said, this is a new concept, SLOs. And it's, it's eager to see that a lot of people are on the yes side, but it's also eager to see that a lot of people are on the no side. While people may think that no SLOs in your organization today are bad, it's actually exciting because that gives you the opportunity to understand it from a fresh perspective and start implementing it. And honestly, implementing SLOs, thankfully, are really easy today. We can use App Dynamics, set it up pretty intuitively, and there's not a lot of friction between us and the systems and the things we monitor. Okay, so let's go into the live demo. So today I'm gonna to walk you through Blameless at a pretty high level. We're gonna understand the service registry, which is where we catalog all the services that might exist in your system, your infrastructure layer or any other thing in between. We're gonna go into creating a user journey, 
and then we're also going to document and build an error budget policy. Now the environment I'm using today is our de development environment, so it's going to look a little sloppy and there's going to be a lot of test data, but that's, that's not to take away from the functionality that we built today. I'll also walk you through what happens when an error budget gets acted upon in Blameless by creating an incident through the Blameless bot. So what we'll do is we'll just create a quick application, we'll just call it um, webinar. We'll go ahead in here, and this is the meat of it. This is where we need to define the things. And really, what we're doing today is we're going to show you a very low-level application in AppDynamics. AppDynamics is incredibly large, and there are a lot of places that you can monitor. We're just going to show you a business transaction, but there are things that you can monitor as database queries. You can measure you know, other portions of your infrastructure layer. You can set up custom health metrics or custom health rules. Um, there are a lot of things, so this is not the extent of what we can do with AppDynamics, this is just a brief presentation of what we're doing with it. So right here, I've defined my metric path. I've just selected the application. When you paste all this stuff in, it'll auto-complete, or you can use the dropdowns to select things. What you're seeing is we're doing an average response time that's not something we would want to measure. Again, this is for demonstration purposes. If we were trying to do latency, the most realistic is we're going to create histograms and we're going to measure percentiles. Because realistically, what we should be capturing in our SLOs is the highest level of percentile that matters to us and impacts our customers. But for the demonstration purposes, this is what we're using. So what our system is doing right now is it's going back and it's trying to backfill all this data. So that means we're trying to pull 28 days of data from AppDynamics we're trying to get all the information we can when we build the SLO. What our SLOs do is we try to give you an immediate snapshot of 28 days worth of data. For some services, you may have stood them up tomorrow and you may have set SLIs up the next day. So you're not going to have 28 days. It's okay. Our system will recover and try to give you the best information possible. Generally, that means you'll have 100% for 27 days and 28 days will show you factual information. Once the backfill is complete, we can go in and we can start creating a user journey. We're going to create user journeys first before we create error budget policies so we can understand how our systems are actually behaving. And you'll see what I'm talking about as we walk through each one of these stages. So our new user journey, we're going to say, you know, we're capturing, let's just say we're capturing DevOps.com's webinar flows, right? That's the user journey. We want to make sure we're monitoring everything that it takes to run webinars through DevOps.com. We're going to set this to in development and we're going to define myself as the owner. You can see down here at the bottom, this is our devops.com, this is our user journey, and this is where we're going to define SLOs. And the reason, again, that we want to bucket things together in user journeys is once this product goes to GA and it's in beta right now, we've added a lot of new features to how we aggregate user journeys up and provide you quick insight into the overall performance of the user journey. So from the previous page, you could have actually seen how all of your SLOs are performing and then give you a rough idea how user journey is performing. We'll come here and we'll define this. We'll just say the latency up below. We'll select an error budget policy, but we'll go through the process of creating one after this. Let's just say we'll use the latency SLO error budget policy. We'll use the, the SLI that we just defined. And now we'll set up what the SLO is. We've also made improvements here. We don't just provide you a simple drop down like this. You can actually define whatever your own percentages are. So that's a lot of, of a bit more flexibility because we've identified that companies don't just want 99. There are instances where a service may be 98.7 or even 91%. So we want to provide flexibility there. We'll go ahead and say 99.99 here. What we'll do is we'll define our objective value latency here. We'll select milliseconds. And you can see we actually get a graph. And this is a real-time representation of the data that we're receiving back. And this is what your SLI is telling us. Now you can see I've seeded the system right here with a lot of rough data. Um, I put a huge load test on them early on to see what spikes might look like. And we can see we're going to violate some of our SLO. And we're pretty aggressive. So I would say most likely what we'll violate is probably about four minutes. 
So we'll use all of our error budget. We'll make sure to set the comparison operator on this very important. And then we'll set this in development. Now, what the system is doing is it's going back and it's trying to calculate each error budget for each day. So it needs to calculate 28 days of error budget. What will happen is we'll refresh the page and you'll be able to click into it, but it'll still continuously be populating. SLOs won't actually be ready for true monitoring until a right around five minutes. But as we click into it, we can see we have 2020 So you can see if I refresh again, that continuously populates data. We'll give it a few more seconds and we'll talk about this page. Right here when you're in this page, what you're trying to get a glimpse at is the reverse error budget burn down chart. So everything starts from 100% and we reverse burn down. And really when you hover over these things, you can understand you have the total time. And then as you consume time, you'll see how much time is actually being consumed in this graph and what it's relative to your error budget. Now, when you have targets like 99.99, it's pretty easy to kind of understand how much error budget you're consuming. But as you saw, when we have 99%, you had roughly around six hours and 32 minutes. Generally, it'll come it'll equate to around six hours and 57 minutes or seven, seven hours, but we have a lower threshold because of the 28-day rolling window. But in the handbook, it'll say seven hours for a 30-day rolling window. So we'll refresh the page again. And you can see it's calculated all the data and we've burned quite a bit. We've consumed about eight minutes. So that means our error budget is completely exhausted. We're at 100% of our minus 100% of error budget depletion. So we've burned through everything. What we could do is we could restore the error budget here. We could say, okay, you know, I saw that there was an anomaly in the system. Let's bring the error budget back up. So just say, um, Infra guy, not cable out. And let's say that we're going to restore 800 seconds, or I'm sorry, 480 seconds. Now we get a graph here that shows us something's happened, but what's also going on in the background, and what we've improved upon is indicating that the graph is now recalculating. So if we give it a second to recalculate, generally it's about seven minutes, you'll see that the graph ticks back up because we've restored 480 seconds and we've consumed about eight minutes. This is at a high level, what you would view on this page, but more importantly, the next step is when you go to actually operationalize these things. Oftentimes when that, that tick happened down here, we're, we're gonna say, and we're gonna create a war room, we're gonna have an incident that's created for us, and we're gonna identify what the issue is. Well, the cable guy knocked some stuff off. This is really powerful as you continue to monitor your SLO over time. As you can see, you'll be able to go back in here over 28 days and having the context of things happening when your error budget starts to deplete is a great, great utility. And this will also circle back into the war room that's created for you. So we'll talk about the error budget policies. We have quite a few, so let's just create a new one. And what can we do with an error budget policy? Well, in Blameless, there's quite a few things. You can notify via email, you can notify via Slack channel or directly to Slack users, or you can create a Blameless incident, or even create a ServiceNow ticket. We also have integrations for JIRA as well. So you can pretty much define when a 25% threshold is meet, what action should be performed. You can say some, you can do all of them, or you can only do a few, or you can say none. And as you see each threshold, has its own values and own things that you can set universally across each percentage. Once you define that, an action will take place. Let's say we wanted to create a blameless incident or a Slack channel. Well, as you can see in my incident, we have right here a war room already created for us. And this, this is another piece of blameless that's perfectly developed in, in, in the way of creating war rooms for us is that we stand up everything that you need. You have the link to the ephemeral, you have the information, you understand how much is consumed, and it will invite everyone that needs to be invited automatically. And then from here, you can start orchestrating, you know, doing discovery work, posting images, and it'll tie right back into the instance on the other end. And everything will be captured through the timeline as followed. So that's blameless at a high level in a walkthrough of the SLO platform.
SLOs are going to GA. And once they do, there are going to be a lot more features and a lot of other things that will be implemented to make SLO discovery, monitoring, and reliability even higher. I'll jump back into the PowerPoint. Perfect. So key benefits in summary. Let's talk about what SLOs do and let's, let's understand them at a high level. It enables a virtuous cycle. So it surfaces and mitigates the reliability related tech debt. As we continue to release features as engineers, we're automatically increasing the amount of tech debt we've consumed or we've, we've released into the wild. Everything over a period, of, sorry. Everything over a period of time, it consumes tech debt. This enables us to prioritize the work because we understand what's directly impacting the customer and we can immediately set it into our sprints. We deliver the user happiness. We can quantify and guarantee quality by measuring and meeting SLOs. You know if your service is doing well and performing well, if you're meeting your SLO. We simplify the complexity. We improve signal quality in context of microservice sprawl. Even if you have monoliths, it still improves and simplifies the complexity of our systems. We have complex architectures today. We have complex microservices across a number of different tech stacks and layers. SLOs bridges that and kind of mask it to give you one unified number so you understand overall the context of what your application is doing. You gain common ground. It's easy now to understand and deliver that you're meeting the expectations between product ops and business. Through quantitative and quality, and through numbers that actually represent back to how your application is performing. And again, we're data-driven and focused. Here, we're not just guessing. We're not saying we have we need to invest in plan work or we need to invest in reliability. We have data-driven data measures that are telling us and informing us, yes, you can start releasing new features, or no, you need to take a step back and start over and start improving reliability. Thanks, Dylan. They are all great reasons to introduce SRE in this way. This is, there is one very strategic payoff from combining AppDynamics and Blameless as well. This will raise your game. This brings a maturity to your enterprise that gives you a platform for integrating the remainder of your environment. No single product is gonna solve everything. You need a platform that can absorb the data tsunami and merge all the islands or silos of data together. And then with machine learning at the core of AppDynamics and Blameless managing your SLOs, you are enabling fast, reliable application delivery. You're also laying the groundwork for AI ops, artificially intelligent operations, as the augmentation to your teams. The next level of maturity. So, okay, here are some of the resources we've gathered for you. Um, I'm also going to throw in, in the chat panel, I'll throw in a couple of links of just about the research that I was quoting on the way through. Um, for me personally, uh, I think slowdown is the new outage and more related reading. Um, I would go there and have a look at that. Um, it'll give you a good understanding of the 100 millisecond um, versus 1% and, and a little bit of thinking about that. Dylan, is there something here that you'd like to pull people to? Yeah, I'd love people to take a look at what our service level objectives, lessons learned. This is a great article that documents exactly what Blameless has learned. We've dog fooded our application and dog fooded the process that we've outlined for you here today. And there are a lot of great points and things that maybe you can learn or you've already experienced and you can just be in symbiosis with us on. So please check that out. So we've got a couple of questions in there, Dylan, and we have about five minutes, I think, to, to go through them. So I'm going to try and hit them off between the two of us. If you haven't asked your question, make sure you jump in the question area and, and um, hit us up with a question right now. I'm gonna leave this, let's keep this slide up on the screen during the question period so people can sort of screenshot it or take right down the uh, links that they're gonna need. Yep. I'm gonna turn the cameras back on as well um, at this stage, so we might as well just get to see each other again for a little bit. Uh, which, let's face it, in, in the last few months, seeing another human being is just a plus. Um, so let me start with you, Dylan. I've got a question here for you. How do we identify the most meaningful user journeys for, to use for SLOs? Ah, great question. Um, so 
how do we identify it? At Blameless, the way we've identified is we've looked at key points of bottlenecks within our system. Things that we see high latency spikes or low availability delivery. And that we understand can potentially impact our customers. So we try to use those quantitative numbers as a way to gauge those being critical areas. And generally, these actually co coincide or correlate with our high RPS level systems as well. So if you look and identify things of high RPS or things that are closer to the API layer for your customers, that's a good starting point. And that's a suggestion on where to start for companies. Okay, so the next question is for me. Um, if I have blameless and that's managing the sort of SLOs, do I need AppDynamics? Um, the simple answer here is yes. Monitoring again is the base of that SRE pyramid. It's, you know, it's a key part of the DevOps um, infinite ribbon, the DevOps cycle. Um, so you're definitely going to want to check that out. Actually, I'll put a link to the SRE hierarchy in um, from the from a Google book that will be a useful reference for you. I'll put that in the chat window in a second. Um, so different question for you, Dylan, of just are SLOs typically declared at the point of service registration? Hmm. So in our process, how we've done that blameless is <clears throat> no. Uh, what we do is we take a kind of a notebook approach first where people are defining their SLOs on written paper. Uh, they're defining the user journeys. They're isolating and identifying services that might be encompassed in your user journey. And then we define SLOs based on those things. Once you go in to actually defining those, um, you wouldn't declare your SLO at the point of service registration. Um, you, would, you would already have those beforehand before you would actually execute into our system. Okay. So next question, what sort of skills do I need to be an SRE? I'll let you take it first, Dylan, and, and I'm just going to, actually, I think I'll put a link towards this on the slide here. If you go um, that ebook at the bottom of the Learn About the Joint Solution, if you go to that SRE ebook, it's actually a little ebook from, from AppDynamics about the sorts of skills you might need. What, what skills would you identify, Dylan? I'm probably going to be totally off base, <laughs> but I mean, for me, uh, the things that I see important in our SRE is understanding infrastructure I'm um, understanding infrastructure as code, being hungry and eager to debug and dive into incidents, and being kind of fearless. Um, as an SRE, we're thrown into the thick of it. We're going to solve problems at the last minute in the last hour. So we're generally the last call on the last line of defense. So you need to be fearless, you need to be hungry to solve those problems. Um, and I think the second piece is always, always be learning, always constantly look for new resources, go to webinars, look at latest trends and understand, you know, newest curves in infrastructure. And I thought of it as slightly higher level of just going, well, you need to be able to write code. You know, if you have an operations background where you didn't have to do anything more than maybe base, very basic scripting, you're going to have to lift your game a bit to, to play in the SRE world. Um, I think the key concepts of SRE are, are the process for negotiating these things. Um, for the SLIs and SLOs and identifying them and, and identifying your error budgets and things like that. Um, so, you know, but for me personally, you know, I think everything that Dylan just said and on top of that, perhaps just that aspect of, so there's a personality side um, in communicating and, and negotiating with people and then there is the technology side as well. Um, so let me go to what part of, the next question here is what part of SRE do you think has the most impact in the real world? So I'll, I'll have I'll give my answer for it, and then Dylan, you can disagree with me. Um, so for me, the thing that really impacted me as I started to ramp up on SRE and become develop the expertise was error budgets. The fact that you've got something that not only says, "Hey, slow down! You're releasing too fast. You're burning up your error, error budget. You you know you're not testing enough. You're not haven't got enough quality." But you also have the other side of that balance that if you're not sort of if you're not touching your error budget, then you're probably not taking enough risk. You, you need to be sort of like, no, we need some new features in this and we need to step up our business because that's the for me was the lesson I took away from the error budget was this balancing act of taking enough risk that the business business survives um, and and enough caution that the business survives. So what about you, Dylan? What was the sort of the number one thing of SRE that you think in the real world had the most impact? I mean, you kind of hit the head on the nail there. I do think the secondary piece that um, 
is a little bit lower level, closer to the systems, is really good tracing. Um, having tracing and using tracing through um, other services, whether it be AppDynamics, is really powerful. Making sure your tracing is on the right and most critical pieces of your application really makes it easy for when your SLOs are violating or your air budgets are violating and you have you need to debug it, go straight through tracing. Um, that impacts, that has impacted me tremendously and made my life a lot easier. That a big, great point. I now regret not bringing that up myself. No, that's really good. <laughs> and of course, to your point of just tracing across, you know, not just tracing where the code is running on a single environment or a single single container or something like that, but tracing it across where the customer experience flows through. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's the critical piece of being able to connect those dots into a singular story. Hey um, guys, I think we have time for one more about, question. Oh, yep. Sorry, one more question. Okay, I was yeah. about to close down. <laughs> So I've got one more for you, which is how many SLOs should we have? So I'll, 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 you go first on that one, Dylan. Yeah, um, realistically what I've seen, um, generally the max is 20 per service. Um, there's no hard, fast rule. You should have the number of SLOs that are impactful to the customer per service that you're running. That could be 10, that could be 100, it really scales to the level of your organization. There is a detriment to having too many SLOs though. So you've got to find a happy medium ground there. Yeah, that's what I was going to respond with. Of just like, you know, it would be easy in this world to, you know, you've got to avoid bureaucracy overkill. You, you, you know, your job is to manage to the SLOs, not to be managing the SLOs. Mm -hmm. And that's where something like Blameless is brilliant at, at, at gathering and keeping the information for you so you can very quickly go in, adjust, tweak, get back out to your real job and similarly with app dynamics of just you know we're tracing all this information we're collecting all these metrics and logs and so on and and giving you context around it so you can immediately go this is where the problem began this is where i this is where i need to address it so with that i'm going to hand back over to our moderator for for the most important part of the session which of course is surprises <laughs> and things like that dylan i want to thank you so much for your time um today um and then joining me this was great mate i had fun Absolutely, Marco. Likewise, uh, let's do it again. Yeah. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Uh, great questions that came in. I'm not sure that we got to all of them, but if we didn't, please know that uh, the folks at App Dynamics are going to be getting a copy of all the questions. So I'm sure if your question was not answered during the webinar, they'll be more than happy to follow up with you offline. I uh, also want to remind the audience real quick that today's event has been recorded. So if you missed any or all of today's webinar, or if you just want to watch it again, you will have the opportunity to do so. Following today's webinar, we will be sending out an email that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And the webinar is also going to be living on the devops.com website. So you can always go look for it there. Just go to devops.com slash webinars, look in the on demand section, and it should be right there. And while you're at it, uh, go ahead and take a look at the other webinars that we have listed on the site, both upcoming and on demand. Hopefully there'll be one or two or three that pique your interest. All right. Uh, I did mention at the top of the hour that we would be doing a drawing for four $25 Amazon gift cards. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get to that. Our first winner today is Martina R. Congratulations, Martina. Our second winner today is Gonzalo P. Congratulations, Gonzalo. Number three winner today is Valerie D. Congratulations, Valerie. And our final winner today is Chris K. Congratulations, Chris. Check your emails, guys. Uh, should be right there in your inbox uh, information regarding your Amazon gift card. If it's not in your inbox, please check your spam folder. Okay, uh, just want to thank Marco and Dylan for a great presentation. Lots of really great uh, information, very informative, very fun to watch. Really, really enjoyed it. So thanks so much, guys. I really do appreciate it. And I know the audience did based on the questions that came in. Also want to thank the audience for joining me today. This is Charlene O'Hanlon and I am signing off. Have a great day, everybody, and please stay safe.